Good afternoon and welcome to today's Western New South Wales Pest Chat webinar series, episode one, Feral Pigs. My name is Grant Davis and I am a Senior Land Service Officer of Biosecurity with Western Local Land Services. Today we will be hearing from two presenters, Darren Marshall and Barry Kelly, about how to know if you have feral pigs on your property, how to monitor feral pig population levels for successful control, cost-effective feral pig control, and various control techniques. You should see the following control panel on your screen. If you don't, Click on the orange arrow to display the control panel. Here you can choose your audio option, as well as ask questions. You are in listen only mode, which means you can hear us, but we can't hear you. Today's presentation will be recorded and you will be sent a link to the recording in 24 hours. We will be answering the questions you have sent through already in your registration form throughout the webinar. If you have more questions, you can ask questions by typing them into the questions box. We will then answer your questions at the end of both of the presentations. I will start today's webinar with a quick poll. This helps us to gauge who is joining us today and to check that the program is working correctly. I'll launch the first poll now. Got some polls coming in. I'll just give it another couple of seconds for a close. Okay, I'm about to close that poll. Now I'll share that poll with you. So the question was, what is your industry role? We've had 40% livestock producer and 60% other. I'll just send out another poll. If you, can, if you have trouble answering, you will need to exit full screen mode on the next poll. Okay, so I'm closing that poll now and I'll share that with you. So again, the question was, what do you consider to be the worst impact from having feral pigs on your land. We've had 60% poll back uh, livestock predation and we've had 40% with threat of disease with zoonosis. Okay, I'll, I'll hide that poll now. I'm just about to launch a third poll. How do you currently manage your feral pig population?
Okay, I'm just about to shut that pole down. So here you currently manage your feral pig population. Um, our polls have come back with 17% baiting program, 17% of all of the above, and 60%, 67% of no management. I've just got one more poll question before I hand over to the presenters. So the question is, are you a member of a pest management or land care group? Okay, I'm just about to shut that poll down. Oh no, we've still got a couple coming in. I'll just hold on for another couple of seconds. Okay, I'm just closing down that poll now. Okay, the question was, are you a member of a pest management group or management or land care group? And we've had 33% come back with yes, 50% come back with no, and 17% uh, no, but I am open to joining and forming a group, which is great. Thank you. I'll now hand over to Darren Marshall from Southern Queensland Landscapes. Darren has worked with local land services on multiple projects and has a great understanding of the Western region and feral pig behaviours. Following Darren's presentation, I will hand over to Barry Kelly from Gone Above Pest Control. Barry has been working on pig control with local land services in Western, in the Western region for a number of years and has a great knowledge of successful cost-effective pig control. Now I'll just hand over to Darren. Okay, am I good to take over, Grant? Thanks, Darren, it's all yours. Thanks, mate. Um, good evening, everybody. Um, I hope you're surviving the heat. I've just come back from between Wanaring and Whitecliffs, collaring feral pigs out in the western, in the western region, and it, it's um, it's certainly an eye opener to me, and um, and just shows how resilient and tough these pigs are. I guess what I want to share tonight is just my experience with feral pigs. It's it's um it's mainly been in Queensland and New South Wales, but I certainly don't know everything. And I'm really keen for you to type your type your questions in or anything that you that you hear that you don't agree with. Please type it in and um and, and we can discuss it. So I just want to share what I know about feral pigs, and um and hopefully we'll um we'll we'll all learn something. Um so for me. Feral pigs are a really difficult issue because some people are really motivated to get rid of them while others aren't. And um, it's a shame because the ones that are motivated that really do want to have that impact are directly affected by those people that don't. And even when everybody is on board, they're, they're a formidable enemy. You know, we need to know. We need to know about feral pigs. We need to know their habits. We need to know where they go. We need to know what they do. There's a whole lot of myths and beliefs out there about where feral pigs go and where they move and how far they'll travel. Um, and we'll talk about that a bit later, but um, we need to know the enemy. We need to know what's going on. We need to rally the troops. We need to get enough people wanting to work together to get rid of feral pigs. Um, in the Western region, I guess some of the properties are big enough that you can control the, the entire population on your property. However, if you're working with your neighbours, you definitely get a much greater impact. What are the rules of engagement? How do we control them? What's the best way to control them? Um, Barry will speak about that. I'll tell you my experiences in well as well. 
about the best way to kill these animals and, and have the most impact. Um, getting people to participate in these control events. How do we coordinate the attack? Because pigs are smart. They're as smart as dogs. They will move to safe places and will definitely go to areas where they know they're not being targeted. So, you know, if, if one landholder's putting in a massive effort, but his neighbour's not doing anything, there's a real issue there. So we need to coordinate that attack. And we need the intelligence. We need to know where they're going, what they're doing, so that we can take them out. That's roughly the stuff I'd like to speak about tonight. Um, what motivates action? What drives people to want to control feral pigs? Well, I've seen in the polls tonight, a lot of it was um, based around disease and livestock predation in the West. And, and that makes a lot of, a lot of sense. Um, in, in, I guess, Western Queensland and, and around Moree, so not, not as far west as you, out of 118 samples, we had about a quarter of the feral pigs having leptospirosis and about 10% having brucellosis. And, and both, of those, both of those impact greatly on cattle, um, causing abortion and things like that. So if feral pigs are a vector for those diseases, it's a really good reason to, to control them. And then, of course, the impact they have of direct predation on, on, on lambs. Um, now, this is really motivational for some people to want to control pigs if, they've, if they are worried about disease spread and they are worried about their lambs. But what about the neighbours that aren't? What about those neighbours? How do we motivate them to take action? And what's worse is there are people out there that actually want feral pigs. Um, there, there are multi-million dollar businesses, there are DVDs, there are magazines. In the middle of that screen, you can see there's 120,000 likes for, for the Riverina pig hunting group. So, you know, we have to accept that pig hunting is something people like and not everybody wants to get rid of feral pigs. So we need to factor that in. We need to work that in. I'm not for one second going to say hunting will get rid of feral pigs. But we need to accept that there are hunters out there and landholders out there willing to keep pigs because the kids might come home and shoot a few. Or, you know, there's, there's a whole range of reasons why landholders may want to keep those pigs. And I think it's really interesting to point out um, the feral pig control percentage. For you to have any impact on a feral pig population, in a reasonable short amount of time, you have to take out 75% of those pigs. It's a bit to take in. If we went out tonight on the whole Western region and killed half the pigs, if we killed half the pigs across all of Western New South Wales, in 12 months time, we'd be back to the same number. So we've got to take out more than that. Unless we get that 75%, we don't get that impact that we want because they breed second to rabbits and they, um, they just refill. They just they just come back and that disengages people. People lose trust and faith that they can they can actually knock those animals out. So the control we do needs to be smart, strategic, and at a level that takes out enough feral pigs to have that impact. There they are, they're the control techniques. Baiting, aerial shooting, trapping, strategic ground shooting, hunting, exclusion fences, and bounties. In my opinion, they are in order of effectiveness. There's one up there that's actually improved to increase the population, and that's bounties. Bounties are not a good thing because once people want them in the landscape, they start to leave the sows and suckers and they, and they start to farm them. They start to harvest these animals. So bounties, I think, are out. The two that I like best are baiting and aerial shooting. Um, it's a bit tricky out in the Western country to, to grain bait, and I totally respect and understand that. Um, however, all the pigs that we've collared over the last three or four weeks have all been on grain. So, you know, we can lure them into tra traps. We can do that, but I do understand and respect that that's labour intensive. However, if we do want to knock pigs out, it's a good way to go. And of course, aerial shooting. You know, we can cover a lot of country over big areas and we're not relying on a whole range of people free feeding. The others, don't get me wrong, they've all got a place trapping, shooting, hunting. They've all got a place, but it's hard to coordinate those activities across a, a big area. So they don't have the impact that we look for on a broad scale. They may have a local impact, but not at that really broad scale that we're looking to knock down big populations. So baiting and aerial shooting, 
gets my vote for the best um, control techniques if you're looking to coordinate across different properties. So all of this, uh, we speak about feral pigs and feral pig being the, being the problem. Um, we can kill feral pigs in lots of different ways. I would argue the problem is the people and how we can coordinate people to work together, how we can motivate people to actually want to control feral pigs. How do you motivate that neighbour that just doesn't, is not interested to control feral pigs when you know damn well they're having a really big impact on your enterprise? So how do we do that? How do we motivate people to do it? I, what I'm going to talk about now is just the way I've done that. It's a it's a data driven approach. It's it's through GPS tracking collars. I think we need to respect and know the knowledge that landholders have. We need to build these projects with the landholders, so the landholders have input into them and know what they want to get out of them, and they want the projects, not just us researchers dreaming up a project in some room somewhere and then coming out and saying, "Can we do this study on your site?" I think we need to build the projects together. We need to involve the community and rally everybody together to get people's involvement and, and work out what these projects look like. So the collaring projects that I've been doing, they mainly dispel myths. We look for pigs in the landscape that we trap and then we drug them with a drug called Zolotil and that knocks them out for an hour. And that gives us enough time to be able to work on these pigs, take all of their details, all of their measurements and fit a GPS tracking collar. So we use a jab stick to, to put that in. That's just a syringe on the end of a big stick and that, that pig takes that drug and in two to three minutes or three to four minutes or depending on the different pig, they'll go to sleep. So there he goes, he, he's fallen over there and he's knocked out now basically for the next hour. Um, that's a DNA gun. So we take a DNA sample of all of the pigs that we work with so that we can look across the different regions and see how closely related they are. And we're doing that at Western at the moment. That's an ear tag that goes in the pig with my name and phone number on it so that if this pig gets shot or, or gets taken out and somebody gets the collar back off him, they can return that to me. Then we take all his details, so we're weighing him there and then we fit the collar. So that's a GPS tracking collar. It takes a waypoint every half an hour for the rest of that animal's life. It takes that waypoint every half an hour and then every six hours, it sends it up to the satellite and we can get that information back. You could see that the collar didn't go on too tight, but obviously needs to be firm enough. And then pigs are worse than sheep. All they want to do is die. All we have to keep them cool. They, um, they overheat, that drug increases their temperature. Pigs can't sweat, that's why they have to wallow. So we need to keep them cool and then that pig runs off into the distance and he gives us his information for the rest of his days. And that just shows that pig, that same pig running away after he's, after he's recovered from that drug. So, you know, it doesn't take them long to be back on their way and, um, and, be, and be collecting that data every half an hour. It, it's useful data because it dispels myths. It takes away people's beliefs about what feral pigs do and what they don't do. So this graph, this map that I've just put up is, um, is, is that pig's data. Now it's interesting, you know, a lot of people believe that pigs move 30, 40 kilometers a night. Um, you know, they cover a whole heap of country. They all live in the national park and they come to my, my crop or to my, my ewe paddock and, and cause a whole heap of trouble. What this pig shows is those different, that, those dots, so that are, is that pig's information over a 12 month period. The orange dots are autumn. So they're all over here. The green dots are winter. The red dots are summer and the yellow dots are spring. So if you did a baiting campaign in autumn and this pig was representative of a whole range of pigs in that area, which we try to make sure they are, you would have a massive impact if you had your bait stations here. However, if you come to do that again in summer or winter and went, well, I had a really good impact in autumn, you wouldn't achieve anything because the pigs in, are in summer are over here and in winter they're here. So this gives away their secrets. This tells us where they're spending time in the landscape and it tells us um, where we should implement our control measures. So that gives us really valuable information to give back to landholders so they can actually knock out those pigs. That's in the Arcadia Valley up in Injun for anybody that knows. 
and we will have all of this information for um, 30 feral pigs between Wenaring and, and, and basically White Cliffs um, in the next 12 months or so. What this uh, map shows is the movement of those pigs. So each different colour is a different pig and each squiggly line is where that pig's moved. And you can see up the top, that's 2017. And if we sat here for the next five minutes, we would see where all of those pigs have moved over the 12 month period. It's remarkably boring. Um, it's funny that pigs don't go far. They're not like dogs. They don't cover massive, massive tracts of country. It's really good news though, because it means that we can control these things. If we do coordinate our efforts, we can control the feral pigs because we aren't being reinvaded all the time by new pigs. We are fighting the pig's breeding rate, not their, their movement of new pigs coming in. I'm sure there will be a lot of people who disagree with me about that, and it'll be really interesting to see what we find in Western. Um, these all I've done this on 12 sites. It's been the same where pigs haven't moved too far, but very interested to see what happens in your patch out there. We'll go into a little bit more detail now. What this shows is a the red squiggly, squiggly line is a 77 kilo boar, and this is a little 40 kilo sow. The green blob is that pig's home range. So that's where he spends most of his time. But the little yellow or the brown blobs, that's his core home range. So that's where he spends over 90% of his time. So if I take that data now back to the landholder and I say, what's in that patch? Or what's here? You know, what are these areas? Because this is where the pigs are spending most of their time. And then of course, that's where we set the trap or that's where we put the bait station or that's where we send the helicopter or that's where the hunters should go. You know, and instead of running this creek line here, this creek line all over here, you know, this is a real giveaway of where we should target those pigs. And again, if the collared pigs is, if those collared pigs are representative of the pigs in that landscape and we know pigs like to stay together, we should get a really good impact. And just to close out now, um, this is the monitoring. So what you can see on the screen now is, is a blob of cameras. There are there are 100 cameras up there. Each of those red dots is a remote camera taking a photo every time an animal walks in front of it. Um, and so that tells us how many pigs are in that landscape. So when we do a control effort and we kill a whole heap of pigs, often we don't know if that's good. If we go up in a helicopter and shoot 300 pigs, is that good or bad? If there were 400 pigs, we've done a brilliant job. If there are 3,000 pigs and we only shot 300, we wasted everybody's money. So we need to monitor to know what the impact is. And how we do that is leave those cameras out for six weeks before a control event and we get a benchmark of everything that's there. And then we do the control event and then we leave them out for six weeks after. So you can see that on here. We've got before the first aerial shoot in this case. The pig density was this much. Then the, the helicopter went up and shot 63% of those pigs. So it shot them down to this amount. We said before, you've got to take out at least 75% of the pigs. So we said to those landholders, what would you like to do? Do you want to leave it at that? Or do you want to go and shoot again? They said, no, let's shoot again. And they dropped this population by 67% which is an overall drop from the start of 88%, which had a massive impact. Now that was that was around Mooney. So, so you know, we can come back and, and tell people what the impact is. You can do that for a baiting event, any event you want, you can monitor that. And those cameras give away that information, which I think is really important and really valuable. And then if you want to get really tricky, you put the collar data over the top of the cameras. So you can see the, the red dots where the cameras were and each different color here, are different feral pigs in that area. Coincidentally, this is at Inverell in, in northern New South Wales. Um, coincidentally, there was an aerial shoot there a couple of days ago, and they have targeted those pigs to see how many they could take out. And we're waiting for that information to come back. So in my opinion, using the monitoring and the collars is really valuable because it dispels myths and it tells landholders the truth about what the feral pigs are doing in their area and therefore they can target them a whole lot better 
if that's what the landholders and their communities would like to do. Are we getting any traction? These are the sites um, that, that we've done, that we're doing and, and the future ones. And I, I hope that it's really valuable information. I hope it is really useful to go back to landholders and give them this, this important information if they do want to control feral pigs and hopefully motivate the people that aren't interested in doing it at the beginning. So is feral pig management a problem in your area? I mean, you know, that's the, that's the big question. Um, do people want to go to the effort to control the pigs? I know there are some people that are really driven to do it, but you know, the question we've got to ask is where are the most targeted areas where we put this effort to make sure that we get that 75% knockdown that we need to have any impact on the population? You know, I'll leave it there, mate. Um, unless you want to do any questions or anything like that, I'm good to stop. Thanks for that, Darren. That was really great, really interesting. Um, I'll, I'll hold off with the questions. Um, I'll hand over to Barry um, after this, and then we'll um, then we'll put the questions together, and then we'll read them out, and hopefully you guys can. Um, Give us some more information. That's great. Thank you. All right, you ready, Grant? Over to you, Barry. I'm just sharing now. Good to go. Yes, Barry, you should have the. Can you see that screen, Grant? Excellent. Thank you, Barry. We can see your screen. Far away. No worries. Thanks, Grant. Um, just a quick introduction. Who doesn't know me? Anyone around? Uh, most around Houston, Barrandal, out to Hay, um, Booligal, and Hilston, Homebush. Probably run into me in the last 10 or so years. Um, so just um, get organised here. So it's just my history. Um, I've been doing pest and weed control, just a contractor for 38 years. Um, been doing feral pig projects for the last 15 years. Um, and that's been generally six months of the year for 15 years of just been on feral pigs during, mainly during the summer. Um, been doing tri-state projects with South Australia, New South and, and Victoria. Um, part of those projects, we developed a feral pig trap and baiting accreditation course that a few mobs have used, Vic Parks, um, New South Wales Office of Water, New South Wales Parks, Lanco groups, mainly Lachlan, Lower Lachlan, um, Houston, Booligal, and um, Homebush. Um, it's like Darren said, I mean, I'm no expert. I mean, I learn every day working with others. I learned a shitload already tonight from Darren. Um, so it was good. Um, and I pick up so many little tricks and ideas from landholders themselves doing feral pig work. So it's one of those things, it doesn't matter how long you've been doing it, um, you always, um, you've got to keep learning. So today or tonight is just a brief overview on what I think is important for good pig control. And then just a quick overview of um, what new stuff that um, I've been doing and what we hope to achieve in 2021. Um, Darren quickly touched on First thing you do is, is to know your target. Know what you're after and, and where they're going. And um, I mean, that tracking and is a monitoring thing is yeah, it's a tremendous thing, I think. Um, and um, because they're opportunity, they're omnivores, so there's only about pigs and us that I know of anyway, um, and their breeding rates. But um, So one of the things I'm really 
keen on is when I'm doing a peak control is human activity is to go to those sites as least as you have to um, don't take your mates out there just to show them what you're doing don't let the kids go out there um, so human activity the less the better um, and then we have a lot of trouble with um, landholders um, all our sites all set up is they've always got cameras on them um, one landholder he says look I know the pigs are there I know they're coming in every night he says but I just can't get them in the trap um, so I said, well, let's go and have a look at your photos. We had a look at the photos. He'd take his dogs out. The dogs would jump off the back of the ute, walk around and piss on the trap and and put their scent everywhere. And there's not, there's probably not a pig in New South Wales that hasn't been chased by a dog before. So it really did have a detrimental impact on his um, control. The other thing is patience. Um, you just got to be patient and not rush it deal with landholders all the time they'll just go and just want to put a trap up and they want to set it after two days or they'll put some grain out then they'll bait it after two days um, and they're always going to get some pigs but the more patient you are the more pigs you're going to get every time guaranteed um, when we go to the landholders um, we've been asked into different places for pig control or pig problems and they want me to do something with their pigs the first question I asked is, what do you got? How many you got? And I said, oh, well, we've seen three or four and, and whatever. So the first thing I do is set up a camera. We use grain um, because it's easy and cheap. Um, and we use a, um, a tractant called Carasweet, which is just a food additive that um, feedlots use. So it's quite safe and won't hurt anything. Um, won't hurt your stock if they eat it. Um, and then we just see what we got. There was a classic example where... Um, it was SA Water, they had a compound. Some guys came back from New South Wales and released some feral pigs into a reservoir that was securely fenced. Um, and they've been trying to shoot these pigs for 12 months. Um, and they said there were three pigs. I've only ever seen three pigs and they wanted me to see if I could trap those three pigs. So I set up a camera, some grain, some carasweet at about six different locations. And I showed him a photo of one of the sites, and that one site had 24 pigs in the photo. Um, they couldn't believe it. They just said, we don't see them. I said, well, no, well, they're a bit smarter than you, and you just don't see them. So before we start any project, we really need to monitor it and just see what you got. And then I make a decision on whether we're going to trap bait or, um, or whatever. So in New South Wales, my preference is always baiting because there's just, I think there's too many pigs for anything else. Um, Really hot. I don't, not real keen on setting up sites without a camera. Um, there's some contractors that don't use them, and they reckon they don't need them. They know what the pigs are doing. Um, but um, yeah, it's the most important thing. I, you just got no idea what they're doing, even whether they're going to a trap or how many pigs um, are attending a site. Um, when you're trapping or baiting, you keep monitoring those cameras and you keep free feeding until you've got 10 or 20 or 30 or 40, the numbers will increase over the week. Um, but you want that number static. So you've got 40 pigs coming in, 40 pigs a second night and 40 pigs a third night. You know you've got all those pigs coming in. But as that number increases day to day, well, you hold off, keep free feeding until it plateaus so you get all the pigs that you can. Um, so I'm really hot on the, on, the, on the use of cameras on all the sites. Um, and then they can be set up to take one to photo, three photos, photos and videos. We generally leave them off the videos because they chew up too much memory and batteries and we'll put them on video when we're trapping or when we're baiting. Um, been caught out with cameras a few times. Um, if there's the blokes on here, just tell them to read the instructions because most of you won't. Um, and then minimizing your scent, I'll put them out. I mean, I've been caught by all these things myself. Um, I've, I still leave sites and forget to turn the bloody camera on. Um, then I go back and I'm excited because there's been all these pigs there, but I haven't got a photo of any of them. Um, so, yeah, can't emphasize enough free feeding. Um, again, you can do it for three days or a week and you'll get pigs. You can do it for two weeks and you're going to get shitloads of pigs. Um, one guy, I forgot to take some bait back out to him and I asked him how he went on. He said, well, you haven't brought the bait out to me. Well, he free fed for six weeks and he got 100%. There's dead pigs everywhere. Um, 
So we've got our options. Uh, I'll just quickly breeze over these because Darren did touch on them with baiting and trapping, aerial shooting, um, ground shooting, pick hunters. Um, I'm with Darren. 100% is the best control by far is baiting. Um, trapping if you've only got a few numbers, but um, it's more labour intensive and the traps are set up and whatever. Baiting's a lot easier, it's a lot quicker. Um, aerial shoot, I think, um, is really an important tool. I think some government departments are using it as their preferred method too much. Um, we've got landholders that adjoin areas that just get aerial shoots twice a year, and that's the only control method they do. And as soon as that helicopter leaves hay, um, the pigs know it's coming. They'll actually do a fly over the day before they shoot, just have a look around. And all those pigs are just inundate all the neighbours um, until that helicopter's gone again. They've all been shot before and shot at before, um, so they know they're coming. So I think it's, yeah, it's a very important thing, but I think it's massively overused. Um, it should never be a first option. Um, and um, one day of aerial shooting, you can, uh, you can do two or three months of baiting. So it's just the cost as well. Um, if I had a helicopter, I might have a different idea, perhaps. But this is an interesting wing the humaneness assessment panel. Um, they did the impact on pigs. Um, a lot of people don't really care too much about the impact of pigs or whatever, but if we're doing government projects and things, we've got to be mindful of it and be seen to be doing the right thing. Um, trapping of the feral pigs, there was a mild impact. Um, aerial shooting of feral pigs was the highest, the moderate impact. That was um, the behavioural interact, and then anxiety, fear. I mean, if you're getting chased by a helicopter and someone's trying to take pop shots at you, you probably get a bit stressed out. But baiting of feral pigs with 1080, the humane assessment panels said there's really, there was really no impact to anxiety, fear, pain, distress of the feral pig. Um, so I only put that up there because a lot of landholders have got this thing about 1080. A lot of them won't use it. Um, but after talking to them, it, it goes back to the old strickening days. So they think that if a pig dies and a dog eats a bone five years later, it can still kill it. Well, it's not true. Um, but strickening and all that definitely hung around a lot longer and was a lot more dangerous in that way. So. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm a great lover of 1080 and I hate to see it banned. Um, I know people out there are trying to get it banned, but if we do the right thing and look after it and educate the people, hopefully um, it'll be around for a while because there's just nothing else that can take its place. Not at the moment, anyway. Um, this is the LD, just for interest's sake. Um, people talk about native animals and whatever like that, like a goanna can eat nine or three fox baits. Um, um, Humans can kind have of 46, not that you want to, I suppose. Um, so these are the panel traps that we mainly use. Um, the idea I like about them is that you can just flat pack them and, and cart them around, so you can throw six traps onto a trailer. Um, this is one where we've, we've added extra sides to it and made it um, double the size because of the number of pigs. Um, but again, you know, trapping isn't the number one method that we're using so if you're trapping animal welfare considerations that you've just got to take in, and ideally if you can put your trap um, in some shade and shelter um, not out in the middle of the paddock you'll find that it's a lot easier to trap the pigs um, but it gives them every day if you're trapping pigs you've got the trap set you have to check it every day if, unless they can got access to water and humane destruction um, which is mainly appropriate firearms. A man of people I see trying to shoot big boars with a 22. I know they kill them after about 20 shots, um, but it's um, yeah. I mean, my favourite. I just I I I do an overkill. I suppose I've got a short barrel Winchester 30-30, and only got a big pig, so I just got to shoot them once, and they just drop dead. Um, I think it's a much more humane way to go. Um, when you're trapping, um, just be mindful of your scent. Um, if, you're, if you're a smoker, 
Um, don't have a wee on the side of the tree where your camera is or where you're trapping or the way the pigs are coming in because they'll pick it up um, and it doesn't take much. This picture here is a mistake that we made. We're doing a um, pig project north of Bell Ranald where the ute is parked is where we normally parked and we walked to the trap and we dragged the pigs out um, so there was no vehicles or access. And a lot of times I'll do that as well, so there's no wheel mark, so the pig hunters can't find me sites. Um, but we were getting too many pigs, and I'm getting old and we're getting lazy, um, and I'm a little bit fat as well. So we thought we'd just hook with the, the gator and the trailer, and we're carting the pigs to a burial pit. Um, this time we drove the gator across the front of the trap. Um, and loaded up the pigs. The um, when we went back, there were still more pigs, so we'll get by like, free feeding and whatever. What we don't get the first night, generally we'll pick up the second night. Um, even shooting the pigs in the trap, it doesn't seem to worry them. They'll come back. The ones you don't get will come back the next night if they've been free fed long enough, and that grain has become their their main resource at the moment. Um, generally, we're doing it in summer. There's not a lot of other resources around. Um, so we checked, we didn't have any pigs, and we checked the camera and the video, and the pigs came from behind the camera. They walked up, and where those wheel marks were, they smelt the ground, turned around, and walked back again. So even I was a little bit surprised, but it's just getting lazy and getting slack, and then I missed out on those pigs. Um, we started a few years back doing feeder trials. Um, the big feeder in the middle, is one that we made up, um, adapted um, a cattle feeder. Um, all the other feeders were are the um, only approved bait delivery devices that you can get at the moment, um, and they're the hog hoppers. Um, Western LLS bought a hundred of them, and they weren't being used, so they we just thought we'd get them and show that they can be used and they can work and and whatever. We had a bit of trouble with them, but. The difference between the hog hopper being the only bait delivery device is you can leave your 1080 grain in there for 14 nights. Um, if it's an you can still use an unapproved bait delivery device. So we're using these. We're using shuttles. Um, uh, you can put it on the in the paddock and anything, but that paddock becomes a bait delivery device. You have to pick up the 1080 after three days, after three nights. Um, so we mounted the hog hoppers on sleepers because a lot of the photos show that the, some, especially the big pigs, they couldn't get down low enough to get their nose under that door to lift it up, um, which made it really easy. And these are just dead pigs and they're lying. This was the dam, again, north of Barrow Ranel where I forgot to take the 1080 out and he free fed these pigs for six weeks. Um, got a tremendous result, but um, that was my fault. So these are the hog hoppers mounted on a sleeper, um, just tech screwed down to the sleepers. The good thing about it, the, they've got holes in the bottom that stop the grain from leaking out. Um, they do come with a pig out free feed and a pig out bait, but they're just too expensive and you don't need to use those, you can just use grain. Um, and by doing this too, you don't need to peg them down. They're solid enough and heavy enough. They'll move a little bit, but it doesn't worry the pigs. You can just drop them and go. One of the main things we found with hog hoppers, we got them to work, but it was a lot of work. Like it was a six week, six weeks from to get a really good result from start to finish. Um, and a lot of landholders, um, they just won't do that. Something will come up, they'll have flies or crutching or, you know, shearing or something will come up in the middle of it. And they just can't allocate six weeks to um, get these hog hoppers to work properly. So they run out of grain a lot. Um, the grain capacity is not big enough. So we whacked it in um, banks of two and banks of three, um, which worked really well, especially when um, the pig numbers were high. This is a property where we had dorpers. So dorpers are the challenge um, to keep away from the 1080. Um, this has got 1080 in it. The dorpers were onto the grain. Once the pigs started hammering it, the dorpers weren't there as much or at all. Um, but the pigs have gone now. We've baited the pigs. They've gone off and they've died. Uh, the dorpers have come back and they just 
you know, they just got no idea about getting in it. So the hog gobbles do work really well, but they're just a little bit hard um, and they get smashed up a bit. This is a little video of um, just to show you what can be done with baiting and the numbers. Um, and it was pretty easy. Um, this was this was during the drought. It was very dry and there's nothing else around and the pigs were smashing the feed. They didn't go anywhere. They Because there was water close by, I provided a resource for them. Um, and um, they just hung around. Um, so there's the hog hoppers there. There was two banks of three. And that just shows you how close they were when they died. Um, they were... I said during the drought they were hungry. I actually had to shoot two pigs um, at this site because they wouldn't let me put the grain in the hog hoppers so I could free feed them. Um, they were so they circled me like Indians in the little John Wayne movie. Um, so I actually had to shoot two of them just so I, could, I didn't want to because it's not the great thing to do when you're baiting. Um, but it was either, it's either them or me. Um, so there was just dead pigs lying everywhere. Um, so the only the risk there was you got dogs or or whatever, is if they um, if they lick up the vomit um, or oops, don't want to do that again. Um, this is our hopper ran out of grain um, and the pigs didn't like it, so they just smashed it and rolled it and tipped it and did everything they could to um, to try and find it. This is a larger feed, it's got a greater grain capacity. We've got a five stage door. Um, and we've shown that this has worked really well. Um, there's a few final modifications that we need to do before we can put it up for approval. Um, one of them was that we, the um, very small piglets couldn't get into it, it was a little bit high. So we need to do something with that and the door needs to be a little bit tougher. Um, so this was it out in the field. Um, so we've we've had that out now for three years. Um, we've probably got enough data to get it approved, but we haven't got the right photos and stuff to um, put it up for approval. These are the shuttles that we tried that work really well. If you want a quick way to bait feral pigs, you can just drop these out, fill them with grain. The pigs, because they're so open, they um, they don't mind. They're not fussed by it. There's no doors to lift up. You don't have to train them, um, and they'll just smash these hog these shuttles. Um, but if you're going to bait, obviously you've got to exclude the the sheep from them. Um, so yeah, we we've killed hundreds and hundreds. So that's the 1080 signs on it. That's got 1080 in it. There was no sheep in the paddock. Um, with a camera on there, we can make sure there's nothing else going there but the pigs. Um, the pigs will keep everything else away anyway. Um, and this farmer, once he took the sheep out of the paddock, these are paddocks that were going to crop. So he took all the sheep out, put the shuttles there and just baited the pigs um, before he did it. This is a slow shuttle enclosure alongside the National Park. You can see the time up there is 5.54. Um, 6.29, 30 minutes later, the pig numbers are nearly tripled. So this is where we've got panels we put around the um, the shuttles. Um, again, it's a non-approved bait to delivery device, so you can only leave a 1080 in there for three nights. This was alongside a national park. They wouldn't let us bait in the park, so we baited on the boundary. Put the panels around so that the landholders' stock couldn't get to the grain or the 1080, and the pigs came across from the national park, and we actually baited the park's pigs from the adjoining landholder. Aerial shot, again, of a hopper. Um, we ran some barbed wire across the front. These were done with stock in the... We ran three barbs across the front, which was fine for merino and everything else, but still didn't trust it with dorpers. Um, still wasn't happy with... We need to do something. So this is where we're at now. Um, we try these baiting enclosures, and this was with the assistance of a local landholder. Um, um, and an idea we got to exclude stock and make it easy to bait. Um, we've got two-way doors on the front. 
so that the pigs can walk in and out. Um, once we were put the doors on, that was enough because the sheep would come and sniff the top or whatever, but they wouldn't push down low, and we didn't have any sheep go into those compounds at all once we put the front doors on. But the pigs didn't care. They just they just came and went, um, got a feed and walked out again. So it made them pretty easy to bait. Um, what we want to do 2021, um, because I go from six months to six months or year to year, depends on funding from LLS and Houston, so I don't know whether I'm doing any pig projects or anything next year or not. Um, either way, we've got the large feeder there that we want to, you know, we need to take thousands of photos and set up final trials, multiple locations, and hopefully we can get that approved as a bait delivery device. And then these baiting enclosures, we want to expand the size, um, obviously upgrade from the shuttles, only because it doesn't look that flash, even though it works fine, but just put a commercial feeder in there. We need a stronger door so that we can have the pigs entering and exiting, but when we bait, we don't want them to get out. We want to do it like a trap, so then we can get an accurate number of the pigs that we've baited, um, we don't have to worry about secondary poisoning, and then those pigs can be disposed of. So that was a, that's the um, main project for 2021, and then um, yeah, we'll see what happens. So that's it for me. Um, back to you, Grant. Thanks, Barry. That was excellent. How is mate? Came back now. Thank you. Okay, I'll just have a look at these questions. I do have a couple here. Um, Barry, if you're still on, um, with the new enclosures, um, do you think that they'll encourage more landholders um, knowing that the pigs will be going in there to take the bait and then they'll still be in that enclosure? Do you think that'll um, in increase in people adopting um, baiting as a control measure? Yeah, hundred percent, Grant. That's the main reason we're doing it. Like listening to landholders, and they're worried about those pigs going off to die, and the stock getting to those carcasses. Or, um, and it's the same as Darren touched on before. There's a lot of landholders that make money out of getting pig hunters in. Now, generally, I, I don't have a problem with that as long as they don't get them in while we're doing pig control. Um, let them come in during winter um, and go there harder. So. Yeah, it's it's the main reason for doing it, so that um, those pigs can be picked up and disposed of into a pit, and there's no risk of secondary poisoning. Excellent, thank you. Another question here, Darren, if you're still there, um, what are the pros and cons of different attractants? For example, um, fermented grain or carrot sweet, which is better? Um. Mm. Is that for me? Yep, get far away, Barry. Yeah, no, fermented grain, there's there's, there's there's heaps of different attractants that people use and whatever, um, as long as it's not your lamb or, I mean, I had one guy that was throwing dead sheep in there and I said, uh, have you ever tried grain? Oh, no, this works for me. Um, it was fly blown anyway. And I said, well, you don't want to be educating your pigs to, um, to eat your sheep. Um, so he tried the grain and then he rang out and he just, He's only ever used grain ever since. I use carasweet because it's cheap and it's easy. You only need to put it on there the first time. The smell will just hang around on the ground and whatever. Um, it's a lot easier than fermenting grain and all. It's just it's just easy, easier and cheaper. I don't know if it's any better, but it works works a treat. Excellent, thank you. Um, another question here. Um, yeah, that, that means that both of you followers have um, done a really good job. I've certainly learned a lot. Uh, hopefully everyone else has picked up a few tips from your presentations. Okay, so thank you for attending today's webinar. Could you please take the time to complete the post-webinar survey? 
It is a great way to provide feedback and guide future events. If you have any questions, please feel free to contact Phil Baird or myself. Um, Phil's the email is on the um, here the flyer that went out where you registered, and we'll contact your local biosecurity office or local land service office. You will receive a follow-up email with a link to the recording of this webinar tomorrow night. Thank you everyone for attending. Thanks, Grant. Thanks, Grant. Catch you later, mate. Thank you, everyone. Cheers, buddy.